Did you know that the Iliad doesn't include the death of Achilles being shot in the heel or the infamous Trojan horse? Stick around to learn all about the Iliad and the Trojan War. Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today's video will answer all of your burning questions about the Trojan War and the Greek epic poem, the Iliad. Don't forget the easiest way to support us is by giving this video a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel and hitting that bell icon for notifications so you don't miss out on any new uploads. World History Encyclopedia is a non-profit organization and you can find us on Patreon, a brilliant site where you can support our work and receive exclusive benefits in return. Your support helps us create videos twice a week, so make sure to check it out via the pop-up in the top corner of the screen or via the Patreon link down below. Let's start off by looking at the Iliad. The Iliad was written down sometime in the 8th century BCE by the epic poet Homer, whom we know not a lot about other than the fact that he lived around the time of 750 BCE and has been credited with writing the poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey. There is also the suggestion that Homer wasn't one person, but a number of people who composed the epic poems, but we will probably never truly know. The Iliad is an epic poem written in 15,693 lines of verse and is divided up into 24 books, or what we would think of as chapters. The Iliad covers not the entire Trojan War, but begins in the midst of events in the final year of battle after nine years of siege and only spans 52 days. By the time the Iliad was written down in the 8th century BCE, it would have already been a familiar tale to the Greeks, since the tale was part of a long and rich oral history, meaning it was spoken aloud and accompanied by music. Its history in oral tradition is clear through the use and repetition of epithets like swift-footed Achilles and clever Odysseus, and introductory phrases and fighting descriptions common to oral histories. It seems that Homer wasn't concerned with the catalyst for the Trojan War, nor the final days and the victory of the Achaeans, which the audience would have already been familiar with. But the universal truths of human mortality, war, honor and betrayal, pain and pathos, love and hatred, and how the lives of the characters in the story are buffeted by the winds of fate. And if you're thinking, why is it called the Iliad? Well, the city of Troy is also known as Ilium or Ilios. And so the title translates literally to Troy story. The Iliad and the Odyssey may have once been a part of what is known as the Epic Cycle, which were a bunch of different stories that cover the period from the creation of the universe or cosmogony to the Trojan War and Odysseus's long voyage home. One suggestion is that these other stories were all written down by different people, although there is no consensus for many of them. And although they all survive in fragments only, they all seem to be a part of the long history of oral tradition and complemented each other. The other is that the Iliad and the Odyssey are the only surviving works of a much longer tale by Homer, which covered the entirety of the Trojan War in detail. And these surviving pieces are said by some to be references to these lost works. There seems to have been minimal to no overlap on events. And at one point, the Iliad would have been preceded by the Cypria, which would have included not only the events leading up to the Trojan War, but the nine years prior to the beginning of the Iliad. Although we only have fragments of the Cypria, Aethiopus, Little Iliad, Sack of Troy, Returns and Telegony, we know a bit about what they would have included that didn't survive in fragments because of other ancient writings on these texts. And also a lot of the surviving Athenian tragedies that focus on events related to the Trojan War. We also have many different artistic depictions of scenes from the Trojan War, most of which are found on pottery. Now that we know all about the Iliad, let's look at the Trojan War, what it is, who won, and if it actually ever happened. What was the Trojan War? Well, it was a 10 year long conflict fought between a coalition of Greeks known as the Achaeans, which is what Homer called the Mycenaean Greeks, against the Trojans who lived in the city of Troy. And it was sparked by Paris, a Trojan prince, abducting Helen, the wife of Menelaus, king of Sparta. 
Now let's backtrack a bit because why would Paris take another man's wife? Helen was the daughter of Zeus, the king of the gods, and the mortal woman Leda, who was the queen of Sparta. One day, Leda's husband Tyndareus offended Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and so she made a promise that all of his daughters would be infamous for their adultery. Another example is Helen's sister, Clytemnestra, who eventually marries Agamemnon, the king of Mycenae, and brother of Menelaus. As part of the marriage deal between Helen and Menelaus, Tyndareus made all of the Greek leaders swear to recognize Helen as Menelaus' rightful wife and to protect her from harm. Helen was considered the most beautiful of all mortal women, and she is commonly referred to by Homer as Helen of the lovely hair, fair-haired Helen, and Helen, queen among women. What does this have to do with Paris and Troy? Well, the parents of Achilles, the mortal Peleus, and the minor goddess Thetis got married, but they didn't invite Eris, the goddess of strife and discord. She turned up anyway and offered a golden apple to the fairest. The goddesses Athena, Aphrodite, and Hera all thought they were the fairest. The gods were unwilling to risk any of these goddesses' wrath in choosing, and so Paris, the prince of Troy, was asked by Zeus to make the decision. Athena offered Paris strength, beauty, and invincibility in battle. Hera offered him regions in Asia and incredible wealth, and Aphrodite offered him the most beautiful of all mortal women. Paris chose Aphrodite as the fairest, and of course, the most beautiful woman was Helen. Some versions of the tale say that Paris went to Sparta while Menelaus was away and took her. Some say that Aphrodite whisked Helen away. Some say she never even went to Troy, but went to Egypt instead. And some say she went willingly. But either way, Menelaus lost his wife to the Prince of Troy. So Helen of Sparta became Helen of Troy, and the brothers Menelaus and Agamemnon appealed to all the Greek leaders who swore they would protect Helen from harm, and so they sailed to Troy in Anatolia, modern-day Turkey. The Achaeans were led by Agamemnon of Mycenae, and other cities or regions involved in the ten-year siege against Troy include Veotia, Evia, Athens, Argos, Corinth, Arcadia, Sparta, Cephalonia, Crete, Rhodes, Magnesia, and the Cyclades. And Homer states that tens of thousands of men sailed to Troy. The most important men in the story are Achilles, Odysseus, Agamemnon, Menelaus, Diomedes, Ajax the Greater, Ajax the Lesser, Nestor, and Patroclus, among others. Looking at the Trojans, this is a shorter list of Hector, Paris, Priam, and Helen being the most important characters to the overall story. Priam is the king of Troy, and Hector and Paris are two of his sons. Most of the Trojan War was a siege. It was like nine years of the Achaeans trying to get into the city, and Troy being far too well fortified for that to happen. There are a bunch of battles outside of the city, but nothing really exciting happened until the final year, and that is where the Iliad picks up. Rage. Goddess, sing the rage of Peleus' son Achilles. Murderous, doomed, that cost the Achaeans countless losses. Hurling down to the house of death so many sturdy souls, great fighters' souls, but made their bodies carrion. Feasts for the dogs and birds. And the will of Zeus was moving towards its end. Begin, muse, when the two first broke and clashed, Agamemnon, lord of men, and brilliant Achilles. That is how the Iliad begins, invoking the muse to tell the story of the rage of Achilles, and that is pretty much what the entire Iliad is about. Nine years into the Trojan War, the Trojan girl Chryseis, the daughter of Chryses, a priest of Apollo, has been taken as captive and given to Agamemnon as a prize of honour. Chryses comes to the Greek camp to ask for his daughter back, and even though he offers Agamemnon a very reasonable trade, he is refused. So Chryses prays to Apollo, who sends his wrath down on the Achaeans in the form of a plague, which forces Agamemnon to realize he's got to give Chryseis back. But of course, he demands another woman in exchange. Since all of the war goods have been divvied out already, it means that Agamemnon will have to take someone else's woman. And whose woman does he take for himself? He takes Briseis, who was the war prize of his ally, Achilles. And to say that Achilles was unhappy with this is an understatement. Achilles then proceeds to throw a tantrum and refuses to continue fighting. Since he is undoubtedly their best warrior and an inspiration to the troops, this was a blow to the Achaeans. And as if that wasn't enough, 
he also withdrew all of his elite soldiers, the Myrmidons, from battle. Agamemnon tries to storm Troy without Achilles, and obviously fails, and then Paris, the prince of Troy, challenges Menelaus to a one-on-one -on -one fight in order to end the war there and then. Menelaus is far stronger and adept at fighting than Paris, but before Menelaus could defeat him, Paris is whisked to safety by Aphrodite and the war has to continue. The gods on Olympus have a big meeting to chat about the war and how it's going, with Athena and Hera both insisting that Troy has got to lose. Zeus takes control by basically saying he'll destroy the cities he wants to destroy when he feels like destroying them, but Mycenae will definitely be one of them. Meanwhile, the mortals on Earth continue battling it out. On the ground, the men fight, and Diomedes, a mighty Greek, is killing everyone in his path, and even goes head to head with Aphrodite and Ares, both of whom he injures, but finds that he is no match for Apollo. The men keep fighting, the women of Troy worry about the future, and then Hector, the son of King Priam and way more battle savvy than his brother Paris, challenges any Greek to combat. The Greek hero Ajax and Hector fight until a truce is called when the sun sets. The next day, Zeus forbids any of the gods to intervene, and Hector pushes the Greeks back to their ships and camps his Trojan army outside the city walls because he's pretty confident at this point. Agamemnon realizes things aren't looking good, so he pleads to Achilles to help and offers him some serious treasure, but Achilles refuses. His pride costs many men their lives. Both sides send spies to the other camp to find out any weaknesses, and the next day, the Greeks fight as they never have before, and they drive the Trojans back to their city. But amidst the fighting, many Greeks, including Agamemnon and Odysseus, are wounded. The Trojans smash down the gate to the Greek camp, but the Greeks get some help from Poseidon, and they manage to drive back the Trojans. To keep the Greeks' momentum, Hera uses her womanly wiles to distract Zeus. And while he is being thoroughly distracted, Hector is injured on the battlefield. Zeus is unimpressed to see the Trojans struggling and forbids Poseidon to help anymore. Apollo joins the fight and helps the Trojans drive the Greeks back to their ships once again, with Hector going so far as to call upon his Trojans to set the Greek ships on fire. During all of this, Achilles is still sulking in his tent, and although his best friend and lover, Patroclus, begs him to return to the fight, Achilles refuses. So instead, Patroclus dons Achilles' armor and leads the Myrmidons into battle. Patroclus kills many Trojans, but Apollo intervenes, strikes the armor from him, and then Patroclus is killed by Hector. Suffice to say, Achilles does not take this well at all. The two sides fight over the body of Patroclus, but the Trojans are successful in stripping his body of Achilles' armor, which Hector wears. The Greeks succeed in taking Patroclus' body back to their camp for a proper burial. Achilles rages over the death of his closest companion and swears revenge on Hector, although he needs new armor if he is to rejoin the battle. And so his mother, Thetis, enlists the help of the god of metallurgy, Hephaestus, in making Achilles new armor and a shield. Agamemnon and Achilles reconcile, finally, and the gods take sides, with Ares, Artemis, Aphrodite, and Apollo on the Trojan side, and Hera, Poseidon, Hermes, and Athena supporting the Greeks. Achilles races into battle, intent on killing Hector, who is swiftly saved by Apollo. Achilles kills so many Trojans that the river Xanthos is full of corpses, and the river rises and chases Achilles back to the Greek camp. The gods are fighting each other, which is pretty pointless since they're immortal. All the while, the Trojans are driven back into the city, except Hector. Achilles and Hector fight, and Achilles sends Hector to Hades with a single spear strike to the throat. He then ties Hector's body to the back of his chariot and drags his body around the city walls and back to the Greek camp. The Greeks then set about honoring Patroclus with funeral games. All the while, the gods aren't too impressed with Achilles' disrespectful treatment of Hector's body. Priam is helped by Hermes to enter into the Greek camp and asks Achilles for his son's body back, a request that is ultimately granted. The Iliad ends with Priam taking Hector's body back to Troy for a proper burial, and they agree to cease fighting until the funeral rites are complete.
So what's next after the Iliad ends? Just a reminder, all of this comes not from the Iliad, but from fragments of the epic cycle and surviving Greek tragedies. I'm sure you're wondering where the Trojan horse is. Well, that isn't actually a part of the Iliad, but instead is referenced once in the Odyssey and primarily comes from Virgil's Aeneid. Next, the female Amazon warriors join the fight and Achilles is killed by an arrow shot by Paris and guided by Apollo into his heel, his only vulnerable spot. Paris gets shot by Philoctetes and Ajax goes mad and slaughters a bunch of sheep before committing suicide because he wasn't given Achilles' armor. Then Odysseus, with the help of Athena, comes up with a sneaky plan to build a giant horse, hide some warriors inside and pretend that it's a gift to the Trojans. Then, once it's in the walls, leap out, open the gates to the other Greeks, and completely destroy the city. And that is exactly what happens. Helen returns to Sparta with Menelaus. Odysseus sails all around the Mediterranean and takes 10 years to return home. That's what the Odyssey is all about. And Agamemnon is promptly murdered by his wife, Clytemnestra, upon his return to Mycenae, as she has been happily having an affair while he was away. So did the Trojan War actually happen? And do we know where Troy is now? Both wonderful questions. The site of Troy has been identified as the modern day site in Turkey known as Hisarlik, which was first excavated by Frank Calvert in 1863. And then the businessman and amateur archeologist Heinrich Schliemann continued the work from 1870 until his death in 1890. Schliemann pretty much just attacked this pristinely preserved site since antiquity, and in his excavations, he found gold, silver, jewelry, and vessels. Much of the finds actually date to more than a thousand years before the approximate date of the Trojan War. The site has evidence for thousands of years of occupation and shows no less than 46 levels of human habitation. With these levels having been named Troy 1 to Troy 9, with Troy 6 to Troy 7a showing destruction and dating between 1300 and 1180 BCE during the Late Bronze Age, also known as the Mycenaean period and the age these Homeric heroes come from. There is little evidence for large-scale war, but texts that detail local unrest and the Mycenaeans supporting a rebellion against the Hittite control in the area of Troy may be a possible motive for regional rivalry and thus inspiration for a battle between Greece and Troy. There are also references to Troy in Hittite texts. In these texts, the city of Troy is called Wilusa and a war against the Ahiyawa is mentioned, which some scholars believe may have been the Hittite name for the Achaeans. There is even mention of a ruler there named Alexandu or Alexander, which is another name given to Paris in the story. None of this is proof, but makes for interesting speculation. Unless something definitive is found, because no, a large wooden horse hasn't been discovered in the layers of Hisarlik, the Trojan War will continue to be a legendary tale full of heroic figures and a staple myth of classical Greek literature. Why do you think the Trojan War is still such a fascinating story over 3000 years after it occurred? Let us know what you think in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on our new videos every Tuesday and Friday. This video was brought to you by World History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. If you like my shirt, you can find this design and a bunch more at flowerillustration.com or you can find a link for it down below. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you soon with another video.